Hey guys, Ron here. Hope everybody's well. Look at me in my fake fur lined jacket here. It's freezing. I don't. I've lived in Southern California all my life. I never believed Southern California could get this cold unless you were up in the mountains. And I'm definitely not on the mountains. I'm at, in the mountains. I'm at sea level um, right here on the harbor tonight. And oh, let's, see what, let's see what's going on up ahead. Something crazy going on up ahead there. It's just an ambulance. Second ambulance and fire truck to come to a residential neighborhood that I've seen today. Well, all right, not important. Hope everybody's okay right here. Here's an ambulance leaving. McCormick, that's a big one. Whenever you're out in Malibu, you see that company. Never seen them down here before. All right, let's hold on a sec. All right, well, anyway, I guess that wasn't important. Wow, ghostly lighting. Ghostly lighting. It's my doctor tongue impression. Have you ever seen John Candy in SCTV? Would you like to take a look at my glasses? Do do, do do, do do, do do. I can't do it because I'm not John Candy. But I'll tell you. Nobody sent me into laughing like crazy, doub doubled over laughing like John Candy. But it's also because of who he was, and that's the subject of tonight's discussion. Uh, and I've spent you know a couple hours tonight watching SCTV episodes because I think that's where John was at his best. But I'll talk about that in preparation for this. That was just one of his characters, Doctor Tongue, and his compatriot was Bruno, a cross-eyed, hunched over, hunchback Eugene Levy, uh, and uh, it was all 3D movies, and 3D movies were making sort of a, a very brief comeback in the early 80s, and you get the glasses at the theater, they had them in the 50s, I guess, and then I remember the brief comeback, there goes the fire truck in the 80s, and they would just lean in. Anyway, if you see SCTV, which I want to recommend during this, look for Dr. Tongue, John Candy is Dr. Tongue, it would, they were like, B horror films introduced by Joe Flaherty as a vampire on this fictional SCTV. Anyway, scary stuff, kids. That's the way he'd introduce it. And then Joe Flaherty would want to sell you. He said, send the money to me directly uh, for $27. $27, you'll get 3D glasses. Please send the money to him directly and as postage and handling. Anyway, so the reason that I want to talk about John Candy is because he was really a one-of-a-kind guy. And again, another, you know, they, only the good die young. Many, many times it's true. Not always, because in the entertainment business, <clears throat> there were a lot of people, including the whole 27 Club, that, God bless them, they were talented as, as hell, Amy Winehouse and Jimi Hendrix and Janice and Jim Morrison, but their drug and alcohol use and abuse literally killed them. Chris Farley at 33, I don't know if I put him in the same category as them, but you know, John Belushi at 33, but John Candy, who made it to 44, thank God, was. Um, uh, was just 43, almost 44, was exceptionally talented. And the reason John Candy to me is special is because in a, in a world of Hollywood that is known for, you know, a lot of people say Hollywood's a cesspool. And you don't have to be a, um, you know, um, paragon of virtue and morality to say that there's a lot of kind of demented people in the entertainment business or people that get kind of demented once they're in it and it's kind of anything goes you know you you throw fame and riches at somebody a lot of people just go crazy and they deal with it with substance abuse or they've been dealing with substance abuse long before they got into the business um anyway talk about john candy because in my estimation John Candy was, this is a guy who, 
you never hear a bad word about. I, I don't know how anyone, I mean, obviously, I never met John Candy. I never worked with John Candy. I'm sure he had the normal range of human emotions, as we all do. I'm sure he had a temper. Um, he was a star football player when he was young. In fact, he wanted to be a pro football player in Canada until he had a serious knee injury, which happens a lot. And then that was you know, the end of his of his uh, dreams of being a professional athlete. Um, but, you know, you can't really play football without being able to be in touch with your anger and your aggression. My point is, I'm sure he had the normal gamut of emotions, but I've never heard anybody say a bad word about him. He just seemed like an unbelievably sweet guy, like a, a big teddy bear that uh, everybody loved. Like I said, I, I don't know, unless you guys have heard, I've never heard a bad word about him. And uh, and I think part of it was his knowledge of his own fragility. And here's what I mean. So John Candy was Canadian, like the rest of the crew of Second City or that crew of the SCTV. The reason I keep mentioning is SCTV is some of you know it, some of you may not. I, I of course, saw John Candy, well, I'm not saying of course, but when I was very young, I mean, I saw John Candy in the movie 1941, Steven Spielberg's third film, um, and Caddyshack, uh, it's Caddyshack, I'm sorry, um, Vacation with Chevy Chase, and Stripes, Bill Murray and, and fellow SCTV writer and member Harold Ramis. Um, but I really didn't connect the dots with John Candy, how much I loved him, until I saw him doing sketch comedies, the sketches and his characters that he played on SCTV. SCTV ran kind of intermittently from 1976 to about 1984. And also through the years, it was Gene Levy, uh, Rick Moranis, Dave Thomas, Joe Flaherty, um, Catherine O'Hara, Andrea Martin, in the very beginning, Harold Ramis, part of the cast, and uh, did I leave out anybody? Oh, Martin Short later on. Martin Short, before Marty Short went on to SC, went on to Saturday Night Live. And I, I think it was much funnier on SCTV. Everybody was funnier on SCTV. It was a sketch show where they created a fictional network called Second City TV, and they just had these these like ridiculous shows and characters on this fictional network and that's what the basis was and it was unbelievably funny and clean in other words tv in the late 70s early 80s you didn't need profanity you couldn't have your profanity if you want it no sexual content um, no politics it was just so silly and stupid and funny and the impressions were unbelievable and until you've seen John Candy do Dr. Tongue, like I mentioned, and Pippi Longsocks, who turns violent against all his friends because nobody likes him, take off on Pippi Longstockings, and playing Divine and Johnny LaRue and his other characters are just unbelievable. I think the only person I've ever laughed at it as much as with John Candy would be Robin Williams, um, another incredible genius that I that I did a uh, another former alcoholic and, and drug abuser that I've dead, but he came out of it, that I did uh, a vlog on. Anyway, so John Candy, like I said, when I really noticed him, it was when he was on SCTV in the early 80s. And of course, most people I'd say will probably know him for his films throughout the 80s and into the 90s. And I, I really wish he would have played a drama role, a dramatic role. You know, he played, I remember seeing the first time I saw the movie JFK, Oliver Stone's movie JFK in 1990, and in the theater, I remember when uh, Candy came on the screen, those of us in the theater, including myself, we didn't know it was going to be him, and all of a sudden I was like, whoa, it's John Candy, and he, he was very nervous about playing the role he played. It was one scene, sitting across a dinner, you know, a restaurant table with Kevin Costner, but he was very anxious because he... You know, he suffered from lifelong insecurity about everything, at least including his performance, especially as a dramatic actor. I think he would have been a great dramatic actor. Um, so if you watch JFK, his his scene in that is as Oswald's, one of Oswald's lawyers. It was just really spectacular. And he was sweating profusely, which was 
John Candy being nervous, but it really fit for the character. And um, his dramatic scenes in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles with, um, with Steve Martin uh, and made created by his, his partner for a lot of films, John Hughes, you can see how Candy would have been such a great dramatic actor. Um, he married his wife, Rosemary, back in 1979 before he had really achieved stardom. And they were together till his death. They had two kids, Chris and Jennifer. And, and there's an interview from, uh, oh, I think it's sometime in the late 80s. And he's being interviewed at home. And he says, that, that little squeaking voice you hear in the background is my daughter, Jennifer. And he says, that's the best thing in my life. And I believe the man. He was very sincere. I don't mean to paint him into some kind of sainthood because none of us are saints. But my point is that in a world of Hollywood people that are, you know, arrogant and selfish and greedy and and uh, uh, amoral at best and cruel and all these things, he was just a, a, a seemed like a really great guy. And again never found anything bad that anyone he's ever said about him uh, and apparently wonderful to work with too so what happened with John Candy couldn't he have a career into his 80s and 90s well John's John you know I've only I'm pausing for a second because this is kind of relates to me personally and a lot of you as well whether we want to talk about it or acknowledge it or not I never realized how much things in our childhood can become traumatic, can be quote unquote trauma with a capital T and really affect us for the rest of our lives. Um, I was 30 when my father died, so I wasn't a kid, but it was completely unexpected. And my father was the powerhouse of our family. He was the protector. He was the one that we all knew would get us out of a jam or would just be there for everybody if we needed him. And he would. And he wasn't a mellow kind of uh, strong silent type. He was a very high strung guy but boy was he there for his family. And in other words it wasn't son, it will all be alright. Or daughter it will all be alright. Actually though apparently he did always say to my brother it will be alright, it will be alright. And those words mean a lot. So when I lost him at 30 suddenly suddenly and we of course were not on the best terms uh, we were arguing over a, a girlfriend of mine who was really bad news who has since died in fact her life was so toxic she was actually murdered by a future boyfriend or guy she was running around with he's in prison thank god and uh he my father saw that she was troubled emotionally i knew she was troubled emotionally but in my late 20s or at 30, I, I didn't know enough about psychology to know. Anyway, it caused he and I to be kind of during a rift. And during that rift, he got sick and died. And my point is that when he died so quickly, within a six-week period, it changed me. It changed me forever. If you're expecting something, it's one thing. <clears throat> my mom lived to be almost 98, died a few years ago. Knew it was coming. She was almost 98. She had an occurrence, a reoccurrence of an illness. And she had done plenty of time on this planet and her sister my aunt who lived near her in the same complex she was 101 and a half great genes on that side not so great on my father's side but the shock of losing my father even though I was an adult the fact that it happened so quickly was very traumatic to lose that great protector in my life like I say even though I was an adult he, he was such a strong presence so how does this relate to John well, it relates to John Candy because, even worse, he lost his father when he was only five years old. Uh, so I don't know if he ever had any memory of his father. His father was a car salesman. And his father was only 33. And he had a massive heart attack. I believe it was an actual heart attack. Myocardial infarction. Fraction, infarction. And MI. Heart attack. And died. And... According to those closest to him, and I'm not talking about one or two people, the people that John would open up to say that he never got over that. That was always in his mind that those genetics would get to him too. So 
double that with the fact that John was a chubby kid and a large framed guy and then starting oh you know I guess in his late 20s he became a really big guy and his weight would fluctuate he could lose but he was he was a heavy guy he was a big guy and it's interesting when I think about it because Chris Farley for instance would say in a very would say self in a self-deprecating way and those around him just uh, uh, double down on it and used him that way he'd say hey when fatty falls down everybody laughs he knew Farley that he was primarily his humor came from his obesity um, like Fatty Arbuckle back in the teens but John Candy I absolutely believe his size had nothing to do in fact I know it had nothing to do with his talent and his humor and his humanness and his compassion I believe that John Candy would have been just as successful as an actor comedic actor or dramatic actor if he were you know 185 pounds but he wasn't and they say and that you can walk you can find interviews too with him at least one in particular i'm thinking of where the, the interviewer mentions his weight that john was very defensive about his weight he didn't want to go there if anybody mentioned it he didn't want to hear it and he would change the subject and you know what i understand why because he was probably scared to death um, if both your parents die of cancer, and I know from once I speak, if somebody says you should get checked out for cancer, 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 you're going to get real friggin' scared and real defensive because it's something you might carry around with you all the time. It's sort of a hidden fear. And John Candy was carrying around that fear of his weight. I believe that he thought he probably couldn't control it. He apparently suffered from severe anxiety, including panic attacks, um, which is not all that surprising considering he was such a creative individual. But it affected him in the way that I believe the self-medicating was his use of alcohol and drugs from at various times. Um, so he was a real paradox. Family man, uh, happy marriage apparently, um, loved his children, but definitely used substances. Um, we don't know the extent. I don't believe anyone's ever claimed that John was a drug addict or abused drugs or alcohol, an alcoholic, but he, maybe alcohol. He was known to pound back, uh, you know, his alcohol in, at certain times, but I, I don't know that we could ever classify him as a an alcoholic or a drug addict of any kind. I think that the anxieties in his life just led to, even though his films were, were great, I think that the insecurities in his life and his constant fear of his weight and, and dying of being overweight, of the obesity, came to what was something he constantly worried about, and I can understand that. Now... He did have a disappointment a couple of years before he died. He had bought a share with his own money. I believe it was a million or two million dollars. That's I know that's a big discrepancy. I should know whether it's a million or two. But he bought a Canadian football team along with Wayne Gretzky and at least one other investor. And the investors, the two of the three, including Candy, pulled out when the team wasn't doing so well and Candy didn't know they were pulling out. He was very disappointed when they sold the team out from under him. Very disappointed. I think that really affected him in a lot of ways more than he was willing to show or talk about at the time because I think that was a real dream. It was a disappointment and when we think back on it the films, just like with Robin Williams. Robin Williams had 20 great years of films. 87 uh, excuse me, Robin Williams had 10 great years of film, 87 to 97. And after that, they were mostly mediocre. Not all, but a lot of mediocre films. And I think John probably felt that after 90 or 91, for the last couple of years of his life, his films were getting a little mediocre. He did Canadian Bacon, 
and he was filming a f uh, picture in Durango, Mexico, in 1994, early 1994, and he was probably the largest he had ever been, over 300 pounds. Now, was he drinking heavily at the time? Was he using drugs? I don't know. It's possible. All that we know is he did an excessively long day of filming, and that's the way John was, always wanted to please. It was a very hot day in Durango there. And he, I believe, had dinner with his assistants, assistant or assistants, plural, on the set. And he said, you know, according to them, his last conversations with these people was, he was saying he was just so exhausted, he just couldn't wait for the principal photography to be over which it almost was and to go back home to his family and how much he missed his family too bad they couldn't have been out there with him things might have been different things probably would have been different um, so that next day John didn't show up for filming and he was found uh, in the house I believe that they had a house that was rented for him and he was dead, and it looked like he was laying kind of crossways across the bed. It looked like he had known he was having a massive heart attack and tried to move off the bed. I don't believe there was an autopsy. You guys can fact check me on that one. Um, I don't think there's any whisper of, of overdose. I think this was deemed a heart attack. I mean, it is. You know, it was called a heart attack, but... Um, just such a sad loss, such a sad loss with somebody who was so talented and such a gracious, apparently a gracious individual in a world where you can't call a lot of people in that business uh, that gracious. But if you only know John Candy for his films, watch his interviews on YouTube, see what a sweet guy he is and how, um, how uh, not serious, but he, he doesn't muck around he doesn't joke around he's just a guy just a regular guy um, being gracious and warm and sincere and check out SCTV uh, just brilliant absolutely incredibly brilliant comedy just the funniest stuff and you have to be really intelligent to do good comedy and that whole cast including Catherine O'Hara and Gene Levy and and Moranis and Marty Short and all of them just brilliant people doing brilliant impressions and candy was the icing on the cake for me. Okay, folks, I'm going to leave it there for now. Thanks for watching. Ron here. If you like the channel, please subscribe. If you do, hit the little bell icon next to the subscription button. You'll be notified when I post. And please give the channel likes. Comments are always welcome. Sometimes I get things wrong because, as you see, I'm going 30 minutes off the cuff here. No research other than what I carry around in my head. So sometimes I'll make a mistake and I'll gladly admit it if you point it out to me. Sometimes it's just a difference of opinion. All right, guys. See you at the next location. Thank you. Bye-bye.